to Riding Westward. I'm your host, Brendan Rensink. For our last episode of 2020, we'll be speaking with environmental historian Bathsheba DeMuth about her award-winning book, Floating Coast, an environmental history of the Bering Strait. For new listeners, let me take a quick moment to explain a bit about the podcast. Each episode features a conversation with authors, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, academics, or others who write about the North American West. Our goal is not only showcase their work, but to spark curiosity among you, the listeners, to think more deeply about the region, its lands and environments, and the histories and experiences of the people who call it home. If a writer intrigues you, you can find links to their work in the show notes or at writingwestward.org. And if you have a moment, please do subscribe, share links with friends, leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using to listen, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and send in some feedback. Writing Westward is supported by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University, where I, Brendan Rensink, serve as Associate Director and an Associate Professor of History. For better or worse, this is a one-man operation, with me playing the roles of host, producer, sound engineer, and just about everything else, all of which entail tasks for which I have very little training. But I am passionate about the North American West, and all the work is well worth the excuse to read more and to talk to interesting people. At the end of this episode, I will include some more information on me and my scholarship and on the Red Center, our programming and projects and funding opportunities that you could apply for. That's right. We may want to give you money. With all this business out of the way, let's move on to today's conversation. First, I'd like to introduce to you who it is we're talking to and why. Although the history of Alaska and the Arctic are so thoroughly Western in many of their themes, they're often too far off the map for those studying or living in the American West of the lower 48 to pay much attention to. Dr. Bathsheba DeMuth, Assistant Professor at Brown University in the Department of History and the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society, offers us a resounding statement of why we should be paying closer attention. Her debut monograph, Floating Coast, An Environmental History of the Bering Strait, was published by W.W. W. Norton in 2019. It is a rare book, exceeding all academic standards for rigor and research, but also written with a grace rarely seen in the academy. Bathsheba DeMuth's personal connection to the Arctic come through her in the writing with a sense of passion and empathy for its lands, waters, wildlife, and peoples. As an environmental historian, she specializes in the lands and waters of the North American and Russian Arctic. But she doesn't just write about the Arctic. She's lived there spending two formative years in the Yukon between high school and college, running sled dogs and engaging in all the activities needed to survive in the taiga forests and tundra of the far north. In Floating Coast, DeMuth traces centuries of environmental history along both sides of the Bering Strait, moving from indigenous and outsider Russian, American, and others' interactions with whales, walruses, arctic foxes, reindeer and caribou, and mineral resources. DeMuth narrates both sides of the strait independently, and in comparison, as competing capitalist and socialist economic systems approach the region, its wildlife, and its peoples differently. She asks what Beringia made of capitalism and socialism, and how both systems function when seen not just as human endeavors, but ecological ones. Popular and academic organizations have praised Floating Coast in rare fashion. Nature named it a top 10 book for 2019, NPR, Library Journal, Barnes & Noble, and Kirkus Review named it a best book for 2019, and it was a New York Times editor's choice pick for the year as well. On the academic side, Floating Coast won the 2020 George Perkins Marsh Prize from the American Society for Environmental History for the best book in environmental history, the 2020 Hal K. Rothman Book Prize for the best book in Western environmental history, and the W. Turntine Jackson Book Prize for the best first book from the Western History Association the 2020 Eric Zensi Prize in Ecological Economics from the University of Vermont Foundation, the 2020 Julia Ward Howe Prize in Nonfiction from the Boston Authors Club, the 2020 William Mills Prize as the Best Nonfiction Polar Book from the Polar Libraries Colloquy, and was a finalist for the Pushkin House Russian Book Prize, an honorable mention for the Rachel Carson Book Prize, and longlisted for the Kundal History Prize. I join with these many organizations in offering my praise for DeMuth's work, and encourage all to find a warm blanket, a cozy chair, and to give it a long, thoughtful read. Professor Bathsheba DeMuth, welcome to Writing Westward. Thank you so much for having me. First, I want to congratulate you on the many, many awards that this book has won. 
Thank you. It's been really humbling to see that it's resonated with so many people out there. Yeah, I know authors always hope and aspire. And so it must it must feel feels good, um, especially because the region that you write on both figuratively and sometimes literally is off the map for a lot of audiences and professional organizations. So um, I think it's a testament to your scholarship that you not only force the a lot of people to cast their views farther north than they're used to, but then they actually paid attention and gave you some praise. So uh, congratulations on that. I hope you can ride the high of this for for a few years. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it lasts a couple of years because it's going to take a while to write another book. So. <laughs> yep, I, I feel you there. I'm in the middle of that myself. <laughs> um, Floating Coast covers a lot of ground and there's a lot of ways for us to approach it. So I thought maybe we could start with some really big picture ideas to acclimatize listeners to the region that we're talking about. And then perhaps we can kind of dip in through the chronology that you cover uh, by looking at some of the different wildlife and natural resources around which you work a lot of your narrative about indigenous peoples, Americans, Russians, and others and their interactions with those wildlife and natural resources. Does that seem like a, a fair yeah, enough that roadmap? Great. Okay. What is it that drew you both to this geography, but also to this specific topic? What's your journey that brought you there? So it's actually a somewhat long journey. I uh, really the origins for this this project for me are in a decision I made when I was eighteen, and I concluded that I didn't know what I wanted to study when I went to college. And I convinced that my convinced my parents that I should take a gap year. And at the time, it was the very late nineties. Gap years weren't all that institutionalized yet. So there weren't. I think now when I talk to students who have taken them, there's kind of more formal programming. In my case, it was much more ad hoc. Um, and I connected with this little organization in Cambridge, Massachusetts that basically brokered access to their list of places that would take on people with a high school diploma and pretty much nothing else. And the first place that I was interested in going was this village in the Canadian Arctic called Old Crow. And it was for me supposed to be the beginning of like a, a miniature shoestring budget world tour where I was going to go to Old Crow first, and then I was going to go to Costa Rica, and then I was going to go somewhere else um, with money that I had saved up. And the long story short, I have still never been to Costa Rica because I ended up staying in, um, in the Yukon for several years. And my primary job there was to train a sled dog team for a Gwich'in family. Uh, Old Crow is, is mostly a First Nation indigenous village. And I was so struck as somebody who came from Iowa, so came from the most temperate of temperate climates with just how um, how the the kind of wildlife, the weather, the the kind of circumstances of the of a world that was not entirely human were so critical and important to my everyday life that you know obviously the decisions that I got up and made and the decisions of my host family were, important too, but they operated within this context where, you know, the things that my sled dogs communicated to me or the ability to pay attention to the environment more generally was absolutely critical um, to my survival in a way that is still the case when you live in a temperate place, but in perhaps a less acute way. This is something I thought we'd get to eventually, and maybe we'll come back to it, but where most of us live you can buy some warm clothes or get your AC and or four wheel drive, whatever you need. And you can often ignore the environment around you to a large extent, but in the Arctic, you can't. Right. And you're very aware of the technologies that you depend on to, to keep you warm um, and sheltered and fed because uh, the, the, the environment is extreme enough that if those stop working, it's not like your air conditioner stop working on a 90 degree day and you're like this is uncomfortable and I would prefer if it was on um, it's I don't know how I'm going to make it through the evening if I don't have a fire um, so that was you know it was a set of lessons when I was quite young in the ways in which human beings are so embedded in the environmental context that they live in and I didn't of course think of it in those terms and I wasn't thinking about being a historian at the time but the it really kind of left me with a set of questions about the relationship between, on the one hand, the way in which the environments that we live in shape what it is that we think and how we interact with the world and what we imagine to be possible and to be right and moral and all of those sorts of questions. And then at the same time, how our ideas about what is right and moral and how we should live in the world go out and influence um, the environments around us. So kind of a 
a back and forth um, between ideas and material things. Um, and that set of ideas kind of was always something I was thinking through, through my undergraduate education. Um, and I did a master's in international development right after my um, undergraduate degree. And then my husband and I joined the Peace Corps. And th those two things were really, I think, ways of me trying to figure out um, kind of a forward looking way in which people should or could relate to the places that they live in, but do so you know, with some orientation toward also making human lives better. Um, that's kind of the goal of international development, at least as it was articulated in the early 2000s. Um, it's obviously a term that has its own baggage. But all of that sort of ended us up in the former Soviet Union, where I was really fascinated from kind of thinking about development models, because on the one hand, it looked so familiar to so many aspirations of kind of capitalist style development that, you know, it has an industrial core, it thinks about transforming agriculture in some really fundamental ways. It's about, you know, producing goods for a, a society that's oriented toward kind of making more material plenty for citizens. At the same time, this the kind of Soviet version of things looked completely different <laughs> and, and utterly foreign. Um, and so I realized that this kind of long term interest I had had in Arctic spaces, and then this kind of developing interest in socialist ways of imagining modernity um, probably meant that I should study Russia, since Russia has a lot of both of those things. Um, at the time, I had taken no courses in Russian history, and I was, you know, learning Russian on the ground, um, but was able to apply from Peace Corps to graduate school. And at the time, I actually had never heard of environmental history as a field. Um, so I showed up at Berkeley, which at the time had a um, kind of a world-class Russian history program, you know, ready to go, and then read a book by Don Worcester in my first year in grad school and was like, oh, I see, there's actually a whole field that is preoccupied by this set of questions that I've been playing with since I was 18, but kind of thought of as, you know, my own preoccupations maybe, and, and less something that I could do really fully um, in my professional life. And so that was uh, really kind of a transformative and liberating moment. So we have Don Worcester to blame. Yeah, I have Don Worcester to blame. That's right. I love <laughs> um, it. <laughs> and, and actually myself to blame because I, Carl Jacoby was one of my thesis readers as an undergraduate, and he's obviously an environmental historian. I was around these ideas before I went to grad school, but somehow I, you know, I didn't quite crystallize them until um, my first semester in grad school. But that was, um, I think it was when I started thinking about an environmental history rather than kind of a more politically focused history or cultural history that the geography of this project really expanded. Because if I was writing a history of Russia, then confining it to the Russian side of the Bering Strait makes sense. But as soon as you think about it in environmental terms, that line of demarcation doesn't make any sense. It's not really operative um, in an ecological sense. It's not really operative in a cultural sense, um, at least until the Cold War. Certainly, in the long history of indigenous inhabitation of that part of the world, you know, that's a, it's a place where people move back and forth and trade things and have all sorts of political engagements. So suddenly, then it it kind of expanded as a project into this one that would be on both sides. I like that. I'm a, a borderlands historian who's turning into an environmental historian. One of the things I like most about environmental history is how it um, transgresses borders and boundaries and these ways in which human societies try to demarcate the land and resources. And the land and resources usually wants nothing to do with it and just does what it does. Right. <laughs> I, I love, well, thanks for sharing that background. I, I think it is interesting how kind of the more organic the process by which someone comes to a topic, um, as opposed to you know coming to a topic on purely for purely academic reasons, um, I think the the better the writing is, the more grounded it seems, and it seems like you kind of organically came to this in a lot of different ways, and this was a long time brewing, uh, even though perhaps you were unaware of it, and I think it comes out in the writing. So you begin floating coast with in your preface, um, talking about indigenous peoples and place names, and you note that. With the exception of those indigenous peoples, um, you say, quote, everyone else is a foreigner. This resonated um, a bit 
with my current book project because I'm in the middle of reading through accounts of travelers and their first reactions to different wilderness landscapes in the North American West, you know, mountains and deserts and the like. And I began to notice two common themes. One being that some people feel themselves utterly foreign to the landscape, that they do not belong. And then another group of people which somehow feel, even though they've never been, you know, to this desert or mountain range or wherever it is, they feel some kind of immediate connection and belonging to it. So I'm curious, as you went through these historical accounts, especially, you know, the farther back you go, what are some of those first reactions of these travelers, these outsiders who come to the Bering Strait region? How did they view their relationship with the environment and the landscape? They were foreign to it, but what did they feel? Did they feel that they belonged or did they feel disconnected and foreign? I think it's really interesting how you emphasize these two kind of conflicting modes of interpretation, because I certainly saw very similar ways in which people thought about or wrote about the the Bering Strait. Um, I think for some, the kind of initial wave of um, people who ended up spending quite a bit of time there were whalers from the, the northeast of the United States. So they were coming from a fairly temperate climate and had some assumptions about how land is supposed to be agricultural. And so, you know, moving up to the the northwest coast of Alaska or the northeast coast of Russia, places that are not particularly hospitable to traditional forms of agriculture, many people interpreted that as being barren, right? And therefore kind of saw this as an inhospitable landscape, one that's sort of going to reject the dominant form of human interaction for many of these folks, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, even some of the really, really early accounts by, you know, people like, uh, you know, Captain Cook emphasize that it could be really beautiful. So to me, particularly along the, the coastal regions where the American and Russian ideas about how their empires were supposed to be able to bring agrarian progress to nomadic peoples and you know, everything that we are familiar with as historians of the American West from ideas of manifest destiny, Northwest Alaska looked really problematic to them for that reason and therefore often really foreign. And many people were writing about how, you know, there just simply would never be settlers in this part of the world because what would entice them to come? And the Russian Empire had some kind of similar angst about what to do with, with Northeastern Siberia um, and also because they kept losing military conflicts once they got that far uh, to the Northeast. So I think both of them are are peripheral and therefore we're open to some concerns about being a permanent foreigner, right? Like no matter whether or not this was sort of a a place that you had rights to because of a citizenship regime and those kinds of claims that it was going to reject some of the, the kind of fundamentals of being an American or being a Soviet citizen. But then, of course, there's also the really romantic interpretations of it as, you know, this beautiful place that you can get lost in, in the American case as kind of a final frontier, particularly after the frontier closes in the contiguous American states, um, that Alaska was sort of given this job of maintaining the, the frontier idea after it had closed elsewhere, um, which is a lot of baggage to carry, right? That's a pretty freighted problematic set of things to impose on a on a place. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, this this disparity between other frontiers that had existed for both Russia and the Soviet Union and for the Americans and all those processes of peopling it with uh, you know settlers or you know miners or whoever it was and the infrastructure that links it all up and how the remote nature of of the Bering Strait so many of those um, connections and processes uh, seem to really break down and the way that things played out a little bit closer to the core of these empires is just going to play out quite differently. I'm also fascinated by the stark disparity between the biological productivity of the maritime ecosystems in the Bering Strait versus the terrestrially based ones. So these oceans are uh, some of the most biologically productive environments on the planet, right? The amount of biomass that is produced. And then you step on land. And as you say, people viewed it as just absolutely desolate and barren, which, you know, helps explain why indigenous peoples there were so linked to the sea. It explains why the Americans and Russians and others who came up there came by sea, right? It was for the bounty that the sea held. And I think for a lot of Western 
historians or just people who live in the West, we think in terrestrial terms. When we think about region or landscape, we don't think about seascapes. We think about land and we judge it accordingly in terms of whether it's barren or productive or bountiful or you know whatever labels you want to put on it. So for those of us more used to thinking about land-based region, how do we need to think differently uh, with your example? And not just about the maritime spaces, but about how these spaces are linked uh, along the coast, how you know, the, the ocean and the land and the human interactions with both are, are linked. How do we need to reorient ourselves to be more, kind of more comfortable in, in this landscape and with your book? One of the things I found really, um, as I was, was doing the research for this book and thinking about how to kind of introduce readers to this part of the world if they weren't familiar to it, is how the fact that this is a place where the terrestrial and the marine boundary, which I think in many environments is actually an extremely plastic space, it's not fixed, it's one that is actually moving at all times. And most coastal societies have deep connections both to the maritime and to the terrestrial, you know, as necessarily terrestrial beings, we, you know, need to live on land, but obviously there's the capacity to spend large amounts of time at sea. But the it, the Bering Strait, because of the fact that it freezes over every winter, that boundary is not even metaphorically plastic, right? It's it just appears and disappears that you have something that was maritime becomes terrestrial in a sense and something that was terrestrial disappears every spring and summer um, and then kind of reforms itself again. And that that to me is a helpful way of thinking about even maritime and terrestrial interfaces that don't have sea ice, that actually there is this kind of consistent going back and forth because of the way that winds and waves and you know, other kinds of currents are moving through these spaces at all times, right? Where I'm living in Rhode Island, our weather comes from the sea so much of the time. So even though I'm not a maritime person here, I don't go out on the ocean, much of my daily life actually has a lot to do with what's happening out to sea. Um, and obviously things that we're doing on land here are influencing the, you know, the marine ecosystem of the bays and, and things like that. So I think in some ways kind of extending that metaphor that these spaces are going back and forth across each other to some degree, as opposed to seeing them as kind of a line of demarcation might, might be a way to kind of break some of that down. Because I think for, for many places that are on coasts, that's actually how they're experienced, that you move back and forth um, and they're not, they're not just sort of one or the other. Huh. And this was all really new to me as somebody from Iowa, right? <laughs> like I came from a part of the world that's very, very far from, uh, from thinking about an ocean. You may have had some ponds freeze over and do like mm -hmm. ice fishing yes. maybe, but that's probably about as close as you <laughs> could get to yeah. this experience. Interesting. Well, you already mentioned, you know, in your early experiences in the Yukon of how you were just so aware and at the mercy of the elements. You write, again, early on in the book that this environmental history that you're going to start tracing out, it's unlike, say, you know, some, you know, like Iowa or Rhode Island or where I live here in Utah, it's less driven by wars and laws and politics. And you write that it's driven, quote, um, by climate flux or the life cycles of walruses and foxes. There are big historical things happening, but driven by, you know, by, by walrus life cycles and foxes, which, um, turns a lot of things on its head. So, so it seems to me again that this speaks to how in Iowa, you know, humans were pretty good at bending the environment to their economic wills and, and molding the environment to be um, economically productive in, in the ways that they wanted. They had, didn't have to adapt quite as much to those environments. But in the, along the Bering Strait, that's very different. So how, how, does this Im, how did this impact human histories differently along the Bering Strait? The fact that they had to adapt to the environment so much more than uh, in more temperate climates. So I think one way of, of thinking about this is that in the Arctic itself, you know, there are people who have lived there for thousands and thousands of years for whom it's not a particularly challenging place or any more challenging than any other environment, right? And for whom the landscape seems quite bountiful and you know filled with possibilities but if you come up to that place from a temperate zone and you're accustomed to you know long growing seasons and the capacity for the kinds of agriculture that were you know practiced on the american prairies 
it looks like a very different and, and really kind of challenging place. And I think it was challenging in Beringia because, you know, the, the two big ideologies that I map out that arrive there, the kind of American style capitalism and the Russian style socialism or Soviet style socialism are both kind of ideas that imagine that the role of human beings is to extract as much energy as possible from the places that that human beings inhabit and kind of put that to social use. And that that was a real kind of bedrock principle, both of American settler colonial westward expansion and of the, the kind of Soviet dream to, you know, electrify every home, as Lenin put it, um, that these were these were ways of living in places that required the capacity to extract a lot of energy and therefore turn the the far north into a challenging place to live um, because it it the energy operates somewhat differently in those ecosystems. It doesn't have a growing season for traditional agriculture. It's challenging to industry just because many internal combustion engines don't work quite as well when it's you know it hit you know a place in um, Siberia today hit. You know, minus 50 degrees Celsius, the airplanes don't work particularly well when it's that cold. So th those things really become operative if you're kind of operating DNA of your ideology is that you need to be able to extract. Yeah, extract energy and profit and maximize profit as opposed, I mean, indigenous peoples were also extracting energy, but they were extracting energy within a system to to inhabit and survive in that landscape. And so the, you know, the parameters of uh, and expectations of what they were to do with the environment were were completely different. Um, let's talk, let's go through some of these uh, some of the wildlife and some of these animals. Uh, you start with whales. That's what brings non-indigenous peoples up there first. And you say that often the state follows these rushes, be it for whales or or furs or precious metals uh, later. And I, this is a part of your book that I had a real hard time getting through quickly because I just. I was just spending so long on every page because it was just, it was so fascinating. Uh, what, what was the scope of kind of pre-European whale populations, you know, compared to, um, to kind of how that evolves? Because I mean, I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and I remember hearing stories as a kid, you know, these tall tales, these kind of local tall tales about how the early white settlers there, that they could walk across the river, you know, on the mm -hmm. backs of the salmon or the sturgeon without getting their feet wet, you know? But you know these tall tales that kind of speak to this myth of super abundance. Uh, there was just so much. Um, so, what was the kind of the scope of of whale populations? We'll start there. Um, Pre Euro Americans, and then how does that start to change? So the the all of these numbers are somewhat kind of partial because they're based on reconstructions. Essentially, um, modern biologists have never been able to see what kind of a fully intact or a, a pre-industrial whaling ecosystem looks like in the in the far north as they really have not been able to do pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, but the, the kind of reconstructions that marine biologists have done estimate that the number of bowhead whales, for example, and bowheads are the species that are particularly important both to indigenous whalers and to commercial whalers in the 19th century. And they're massive animals. They you know can grow up to a hundred tons um, they can live for a couple of centuries. Um, they have a very different lifespan than human beings do. Um, the population in the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas, which are kind of the interlocked bodies of water that they migrate through, was over 20,000. So a pretty robust population. Um, by the early 20th century, which is about 60 years after commercial whalers start harvesting or killing is probably the better verb. <laughs> um, whales around the Bering Strait, there were probably 3,000 left. So it's a it's a massive harrowing to use um, Melville's term of the oceans as it had been with right whales in the Atlantic and right whales in the Pacific and sperm whales. Um, and that, you know, that kind of drive for harvesting came from the Eastern seaboard of the United States where whale oil in the United States was one of the best ways to light your home. Um, whale oil doesn't smell when you burn it. It has a really clear flame. So many of the other products that were on the market, like you know, pig tallow, made your house smell like bacon all the time, which might smell good, but might get a little old. Um, they go rancid really quickly. 
there, there were lots of problems with some of the other kinds of, of lighting. If you were looking for just sort of a clear, nice evening light, it gets dark pretty early here on the East Coast. Um, the population was going up in the you know 1850s, 1860s. So the demand for whale oil was kind of going up with it. And people also used whale baleen, which is the kind of feeding apparatus um, on bowhead and humpback and other whale species that they sift krill out of the ocean with. And it worked more or less like a kind of protoplastic. Um, it's made out of keratin, so it's the same substance as your fingernails, and you can you know bend it when it's heated to take a shape. So it was used to make umbrella spines and whip handles and probably most famously and importantly for the whales, uh, women's corsets. Um, so if I had been you know living in Rhode Island in 1850 and I was a well-off woman, I would have been you know wearing whales right next to my skin more or less. Um, and that that demand actually helped keep the industry for bowhead whaling going after petroleum products started coming online in 1859. Um, and of course, that's kind of a slow transition between people using kerosene and people using um, whale oil or whale oil fading out for kerosene. Um, but even after whale oil was more or less out of use commercially, people were killing whales for their baleen. Was bowhead kind of the primary whale being harvested because of its numbers or was it easier to hunt or did it have higher quality oil than other um, baleen uh, but whales with baleen, what was specific to bowheads and also specific to indigenous peoples hunted, hunted bowheads more than others, correct? Yeah, so for um, for the Nupiak and the Yupik and the Chukchi, who are the three peoples who live right around the edges of the, the Bering Sea, bowhead whales and gray whales were the two species that were hunted primarily. Um, and that's mostly because of the, the ways in which those two species migrate um, and spend time close to shore or close to the edge of the sea ice. So there are some many other whale species that are present in the Bering Sea, but most of them tend to spend a lot of time far out at sea. Um, so the sperm whales that get up into the Bering Sea are deep water animals. So if you're hunting from shore, they're extremely difficult to get to. Um, so that was kind of the, what set the relationship between people and bowhead whales in the Bering Sea for you know, thousands of years prior to the arrival of commercial whalers. The the Yankee fleet who, you know, left from New Bedford, Massachusetts and from Providence and kind of up and down the, the seaboard here on the East Coast, they ended up in the kind of Pacific side of the Arctic, more or less because they had hunted the species that were closer to home to real rarity. So it's an industry that started in the Atlantic, um, hunted its way through the Atlantic and then starts to expand into the Southern Atlantic, goes around South America and comes up through the Pacific, um, past Hawaii eventually, and just keeps working north. And part of it is because the technology of whaling in the 19th century, the kind of Moby Dick style tall ship whaling actually can't pursue that many whale species. So they could kill gray whales, right whales, um, occasionally a humpback whale and sperm whales and bowheads. And so the really big whales like blues and fins, um, they couldn't get to, they were too large essentially to process. Um, and some whale species were simply too fast. And the bowheads, when they first arrive in the Arctic, the commercial fleet are kind of slow. They're, you know, will come right up to um, the hunter's boats and they have incredibly high quality oil and baleen. Um, so they, they, they look like a real bonanza to these captains that, you know, if you were hunting along the Bering Strait and your ship left from New Bedford, Massachusetts, you're pretty desperate to kill some whales because that's very, very far from home. And, you know, every month you're at sea, you're at risk of all sorts of, you know, mishaps and mayhem. So, um, And here they are swimming right up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You do say that they eventually start adapting and start using the ice to hide and they start um, migrating more under the edges of the ice as opposed to out the open water, which I find fascinating. And again, you know, these species with these incredible lifespans, you know, that they're able to uh, adapt. And you, you weave this um, hypothetical tale of uh, a bowhead born around 1800, and you kind of revisit this bowhead whale a couple times throughout your narrative, you know, you know, 80 years later, here's what it would have been experiencing. But it is, 
it is difficult to wrap our heads around the fact that uh, that really a bowhead whale that was born in the middle of this story uh, that's you know could actually still be swimming around today and you know what kind of history is stored right in that you know i i so that. wish i could interview one i mean that's, <laughs> it's a it's a great tragedy of my yeah. professional life but it's really tragic because the existence of this whale is what what was one it was a key species that had brought stability to the region for indigenous peoples right they could rely on the annual migrations and they they built so much of their society and economy and subsistence around it so when those whales are removed in such drastic fashion it it's disastrous for the people who would who would live there one of the next animals that you that you go to which i think is one that people would think of less um is walruses this ungainly just bizarre I mean, we see them in zoo in zoos and they're just such bizarre creatures um i've seen footage underwater they actually swim remarkably well for for what you know a large you know for how they kind of waddle around on on land or or roll i've seen them like there's <laughs> yeah. like they like they roll and fall down the hills and stuff anyway uh, but you here you you write this i really like this line you say walruses are coastline embodied they cannot eat without the sea but they must breed and birth in the air which i thought maybe makes them kind of maybe the best analog for humans who live in beringia right like they can't exist without the sea but they they need the land as well. How does the story of of walrus hunting go? Like, why are Russians and Americans coming and hunting walruses? And what does the disappearance of the walrus do to the indigenous peoples? Uh, the walrus hunting at kind of a commercial scale. So walrus hunting has been really critical for Yupik and Chukchi and Anupiak communities for a very, very long time, um, but at a very sustainable level. Um, but walrus hunting at a at a scale that really threatens to you know put the herds in danger of at least a kind of species bottleneck, if not extinction, starts to happen more or less as a result of commercial whaling. So you have these whaling ships that you know are on these voyages that last eighteen months or two years or two and a half years, and they eventually get to the point where they're killing bowhead whales so efficiently that they're running out of bowheads that they can access easily or can access at all. And they start looking around at these the herds of Pacific walrus that are hanging out on the sea ice. Are herds? Um, and often, is that the term for a collective? Yeah, pods of whales, yes. but herds pods of, of whales walrus? Herds of walrus. Okay. <laughs> um, and they actually, many of the sailors compare them to cows, um, that they will like look out over the sea ice and it looks like you're looking at a kind of grazing pasture full of cows. There were probably a quarter of a million plus um, walruses in the Bering Strait prior to commercial hunting starting. And they also have a lot of um, oil in their blubber. It's not quite as good as bowhead oil if you're trying to burn it in a lamp. Um, But the commercial whaling crews found that if they were not killing enough bowheads to fill up their holds with oil, that they could could make up some of that time that they were spending in the Arctic with... um, with killing large numbers of walrus. And that meant like, you know, hundreds in a day, Um, they would refine the blubber down just like they did with bowhead whales. And then they would also take the tusks, which walrus have, you know, those very, you know, kind of paradigmatic tusks in the front that are made out of ivory um, and could be sold basically as a replacement for people who couldn't quite afford elephant ivory. Um, so if you wanted ivory buttons or you wanted, um, you know, ivory inlay on a trunk or pool cues, it was put to all sorts of uses once it made its way back to the United States. And so this kind of commercial hunting of the herds uh, meant that by the beginning of the 20th century, the walrus numbers were were really imperiled, um, you know, in the, the tens of thousands, not the hundreds of thousands. And then the United States kind of as an Um, outgrowth of uh, legislation and kind of a movement that I'm sure many people are familiar with, the kind of Teddy Roosevelt conservation movement, um, makes its way to Alaska and walrus has become a protected species, at least if you're in American territorial waters. Um, There are some people who still hunt them on the Russian side of the Bering Strait because there was not an enforcement by the Russian state there. Although by the early 20th century, um, Yupik and uh, Chukchi communities were actually essentially enforcing conservation regimes on their own. They would try to expel foreign hunters um, and kind of keep local walrus killing to a, a sustainable level. Um, 
And that allows the herds to kind of rebound. And by, you know, the 1930s, they're probably doing pretty well again, except the, the kind of story shifts to what's happening in Russia in that period, um, which is the Soviet Union has taken control of the Russian side of the Bering Strait. Um, and in the 1930s, Joseph Stalin comes to power and kind of rolls out a series of reforms that include, that they have many parts, um, but that include kind of an emphasis on increasing production and collectivized production in particular. And this covers everything um, in the Soviet Union. So factories that were making shoes were supposed to produce more shoes. Peasants who were farming grain were supposed to produce more grain. And if you were in a walrus hunting collective, you were supposed to produce more walrus blubber and ivory. So the numbers of walrus killed per year start going back up and, you know, reach the same kinds of numbers as was seen during the kind of height of the, the capitalist boom in the 19th century. And of course, this starts pushing the number down again. And to me, when I was researching this history, it at first looked like it was going to play out as sort of a predictably sad kind of, you know, America figures out some conservation legislation, the Soviet Union just kind of grinds itself into an environmental, you know, dead zone, essentially. Because I think a lot of the scholarship on Soviet environmental policy emphasizes that if, you know, capitalism is bad for the environment, then Soviet socialism is just worse. And in this particular case, the Soviet Union basically comes to a set of legislative goals for walrus that look very much like what was in practice in the United States, which is limited hunts, hunts that were, you know, focused on meeting the needs of indigenous people for food um, and for walrus hides and other things that were really important to local communities first, um, as, rather than having walruses be part of kind of an export oriented economy, either one that goes into the, the socialist system or one that goes into the capitalist market. I mean, you wrote that some Americans, though, you know, they, they realized early on that the extinction of walrus would be uh, would lead to the extin extinction of those indigenous peoples. And some of them wrote about it, but in practice didn't do much. Yeah, the captains of whaling ships in particular were very, very aware that the industry that they were part of was endangering not just the lives of the animals they were killing, um, but the lives of the the human populations that were dependent on them around the Bering Strait. So um, there was, you know, these kind of anguished letters to the editor, essentially, that show up in whalemen's newspapers in Hawaii and New Bedford, talking about the ways in which, you know, they are witnessing starvation. And there are some years, particularly in the 1880s, along the Bering Strait, where, you know, many communities are um, just in absolute dire straits because of um, the, the kind of lack of walruses and bowheads because of commercial hunting, in addition to some pressures that come from the being at kind of a low point in some ecological cycles so that there aren't as many caribou around as there might be and there's not as many ptarmigan around as there might be. It's just, it's an absolute bottoming out of what the kind of bounty of this part of the world usually provides. Um, and that, that, you know, the the foreign captains were very aware of their part in this. Um, and they also did not see themselves personally as having many tools to redress it. Um, you know, they understood that if they quit, somebody would just hire another captain to go go whaling or go walrusing. Um, and so some of them actually write letters, you know, they, these letters that are published in the whalemen's newspapers are also forwarded along to political representatives saying, you know, in the case of Alaska, you know, we technically own this land, right? Where, where is the government? What is the state doing to provide for people? Um, and, and in fact, the, the U.S. government does eventually kind of start listening um, and sort of follows, follows the whalers and, and in many ways follows the destruction of the whalers and starts to see a need to provide, you know, education and medical care and kind of humanitarian relief is what we might call it now. Well, in the segue as well, because in the next section of the book, you kind of move more to land and you talk about reindeer and these attempts by um, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States to use the domestication of reindeer, perhaps, finally as the process through which they could 
bring indigenous peoples more into the mainstream of either a capitalist or communist society and that that would be the avenue by domesticating reindeer finally something that is somewhat familiar we know how to deal with livestock maybe reindeer can be treated the same way and that could be the entry point for indigenous peoples to individually own herds or or as a collective to own herds and to manage them how does this domestication and attempts to regulate and domesticate um, reindeer herds work in in alaska versus northeastern siberia this reindeer story is one of the first pieces of this project that I stumbled across upon when I was doing research in grad school. And I, I couldn't believe that the world had ever left a historian such a perfect set of kind of inverted priorities. Um, because for both the United States and the Soviet Union, that as I talked about earlier, the, the lack of agriculture as practiced in temperate climates was seen as a real problem, right? Neither state was particularly interested in thinking about this being a productive and bounteous place to live based on the ways that indigenous people understood it as being a bounteous and you know, kind of good place to make a living. They wanted to think about it as a home for agrarian production. Um, And of course, it was pretty obvious that large parts of northeastern Siberia and northwestern Alaska were not going to be amenable to amber waves of grain. That just wasn't (laughs) going to happen. I think the word you use, you call it obstinate ground or recalcitrant ground. (laughs) Like the land itself was just so obstinate and and horrible and mean. And the reindeer maybe is finally the way that they can start pulling energy out of it, right? Out of this stubborn landscape. So in the at the end of the 19th century, some Americans visit the Siberian side of the, the Bering Strait and are, I think, relieved to see that there actually are domestic reindeer there. Because if that's not amber waves of grain, at least it is a sort of recognizably agricultural animal in the model that, you know, Europeans and Americans are used to thinking of them. So this is where the kind of origins of this story of inversion comes from. The Americans are the American government and missionaries are very interested in taking the, you know, often nomadic or partly nomadic Anupiak and Yupik and turning them into kind of property owning yeoman farmers, essentially private property and owning it and kind of managing it is seen as a critical kind of tool of state assimilation. It's how to take people out of the culture that they are in and make them into Americans in some sense. And by doing so, make them kind of productive for the American public. So you need to take folks that generally speaking are relatively collectivist in the way that they run their economies, who tend to hunt wild animals collectively because it's a it's a large job that requires, you know, people working together and turn them into individual owners of a private herd. That's the American dream. And to do this, they import domestic reindeer from the Siberian side. The Soviet Union, when it takes over, finds that the, the Chukchi, who are the domesticators and sort of reindeer herders of the Chukchi Peninsula, you know, have this this resource that looks agrarian and is therefore very exciting to the Soviets as it is to the Americans. The problem is, is that the Chukchi own them as private property. And some Chukchi own more reindeer than other Chukchi, making it, if you are coming to it as a kind of dyed in the wool Marxist, look like they have social classes. So the Soviet Union comes in and says, ah, well, reindeer are critical to turning Chukchi people into Soviet citizens. But in order for them to do that, they have to give up private ownership of these animals and instead own them collectively as sort of all Soviet industry. So you have this this kind of set of completely mirroring but inverted policies on the two sides of the of the Bering Strait. And what plays out over the next you know, several decades is, particularly on the Soviet side, there is a real disinterest and disinterest to the point of open violence with collectivizing the reindeer. You know, Chukchi herders understood very well that these animals were critical to their livelihoods, that they had sort of been the cornerstone of Chukchi political power in that part of the world for a long time. And in fact, were critical enough to Chukchi power that the Chukchi had rejected the, um, or not just rejected, ejected the Russian Empire in the 18th century. So you know, this this was a, a really critical source, not just of kind of cultural and spiritual meaning, but of political agency. They weren't interested in giving that up for the Soviet dream. And on the American side, kind of what it is that the state is offering 
Anupiak people by giving them reindeer herds is never all that clear. So, you know, some Anupiak families become reindeer herders, some still are reindeer herders. But generally speaking, the reindeer are put in service of the ways in which Anupiak want to live rather than the kind of dream of small farmers with their herds of reindeer participating in the American economy just the way they would if they had a cattle ranch. Um, so there, there's kind of both inverted policies and it's indicative in some ways of the difference between the ways in which the Soviets kind of really put emphasis and and military power if necessary behind pushing this process and the ways in which the American side you know, invests a bit in the reindeer project, but is never is never going to kind of do the forceful kind of colonization at gunpoint that is so common on the American West, for, you know, in the lower 48. Um, and that allows kind of the Inupiaq to use or not use reindeer more or less as they have interest. Yeah, to incorporate them into their way of living or not, as opposed to you know, adopting it as their their new full identity, yeah, uh, in a more American uh, sense. How does some of this change then when we move into the era of not living biological resources, but the extraction of uh, of mineral resources? Gold is discovered along the Bering Coast. Um, tin. There's some uranium, I think you say. Mm -hmm. But if there's a more inhospitable place to try to mine this stuff, I don't know where. How does the capitalist versus socialist systems of mineral extraction in this region play out differently on the two sides of the Bering Strait? One thing I found really interesting as I was thinking about the different kind of segments or biomes that this story unfolds through is that the places where the the resource is the, the easiest to control in some sense. Um, so something like a a gold vein underground or a tin deposit, it can be extremely hard to access by people and the environment makes it more so, but it's also not moving. Um, it doesn't have its own kind of habits of life that mean that it moves around all the time the way that reindeer do. Um, it doesn't go feral the way that reindeer do. Um, gold doesn't get a diseases. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that the, the ways in which geological things change happen so slowly that for people much of that change is completely invisible and so therefore it's kind of a technical problem like how do you get to the thing that's underground and that can be a pretty challenging technical problem if you're operating in a place that doesn't have roads or doesn't have easy electricity or other kinds of power but it still is something that basically requires figuring out how do you get the the, the labor power be that labor human or something that's fueled by fossil fuels to the site that you want to extract from. And in the case of the geology, it's because it's sort of reduced to a question of human wills. Um, it's also the place where the United States and the Soviet Union in some ways look the most different from each other. Um, that the gold rush that starts in what's now Nome on the Seward Peninsula is the most kind of un- adulterated, you know, just boom capitalism, you can imagine. Everything is for sale in Nome. Um, everything is for exorbitant sale. Um, and it's a place that, you know, draws people to it really on the, the prospect and the dream of getting money, right? That that's, that's why you go for a gold rush, is that you think that you can actually pull a fortune out of the ground and be kind of secure as a, as a capitalist person, right? You don't have to work for wages anymore, um, which at the end of the 19th century, when the United States had gone through this, you know, series of really devastating uh, recessions and depressions economically, you know, looks particularly important to a very large population, particularly of young men um, who kind of see their whole futures as depending on being able to actually get some capital. So it's just, you know, as anyone who studied a, a mineral boom town knows, it's a it's a pretty pure form um, of capitalism. On steroids. On steroids, right, yeah. And so it's like fast and nasty. Um, and the, the Soviet side, there's kind of known to be gold deposits um, in Chukotka for basically since they were discovered in Nome and probably even before that. Um, but they 
they hadn't been found in large numbers and they weren't particularly accessible until the Soviet Union is able to marshal the resources to bring lots of labor power north to try to extract them. Individual gold mining doesn't really jive with the Soviet system, does it? No. Um, and like even the Russian Empire yeah. sort of tried to get some gold mining off of the ground and had some small gold mines, um, but really had difficulty moving enough people you know, that far northeast, Chukotka, just to kind of put it in perspective for readers, is closer to Washington, D.C. than it is to Moscow. Um, it's really, really far away from the centers of Russian power in the 19th century. And of course, that's compounded by the fact that you have to get overland by rail um, or take a really, really long sea route, right? Um, this is before the Suez Canal is open. So it's a really complicated thing to get people um, to the Chukchi Peninsula. So it's not until the, the Soviet Union um, takes over gold mining that that becomes kind of possible. And the way in which they do it initially is with um, prison labor, with people who are in the gulag, which is kind of the most extreme form of what the Soviet project is doing and trying to kind of transform people into socialist citizens not by enticement, not because the ideology is appealing anymore, but simply by kind of brute re-education. Um, and so that, you know, the, the kinds of mining that appear initially sort of are the most extreme end of what both of these societies produce in many ways. Um, and, and not what the mining ends up looking like for most of the 20th century, which in the American case is kind of big corporate operations owning chunks of land and extracting gold and tin from it. And in their Soviet case ends up being kind of non-prison labor, uh, you know, villages and towns that are built around a particular resource. Did you anticipate that you were going to find this amazing disparity in how the two systems worked mineral resources? Because it, it it's really striking just how the, the same resources viewed just so differently and how they approach it so differently. I really didn't. Um, and I... When I first started this book, I would have told you that I didn't want to write about the gulag under any circumstances. Like it was not, um, you know, it's a subject that has such an incredibly rich literature in Russian history. It's like that has been has been covered. Undone. I don't I don't need to wade in there. Um, and then it turned out that it was unavoidable because it was such a part of, you know, how a certain kind of operation functioned, like how it got its power in a kind of material sense um, in the you know 1940s and 1950s. Well, as we move into this 20th century, so you've already mentioned, you know, the large corporate mining in Alaska or essentially factory mining towns in Siberia, where entire towns are focused on a single um, industrialized scale of, of mining a specific resource. Um, you close out the book kind of making this turn to thinking about technology and industrialized, mechanized um, harvesting of resources, be it biological resources or um, or mineral ones. Um, what does this do to, I mean, so we, we have all these stories of whaling, walruses, reindeer. We didn't, we didn't talk about Arctic foxes. You know, there's a fur trade there. Um, what is the industrialization and the introduction of, of, you know, industrial technology do to these, in many cases, already waning industries that mm -hmm. are no longer sustainable? And so I'm curious about kind of this tension between the industrialization of these industries. And then also I noticed, you know, simultaneously um, the discussion in your book of indigenous peoples and their involvement in these activities have really kind of is almost absent for long stretches, whereas they had been so prominent in the previous. And I think there, there's, there's, there's a connection there. Can you walk us through these kind of final stages a little bit? Yeah, I think that whaling is actually a good place to see a lot of these tensions play out. Um, the, there's a sense I had in the, the kind of logbooks and ways in which whalers themselves talked about their industry in the United States at the end of the 19th and earliest 20th centuries that is very self-reflective, right? They understand that whaling at a scale that is necessary to feed demand is going to run these animals into extinction. And they use the word extinction, like in whalers newspapers. So that's kind of a known thing. Um, and basically what stops it is that there ceases to be a demand for baleen and for um, whale oil because of petroleum and because of the invention of spring steel that replaces baleen. 
And so it looks briefly like whaling is going to just kind of, it's done, right? That it's a romantic thing of the past and we can all read Moby Dick and move on. Um, but then in kind of a unfortunate for the whales twist, Norway invents kind of a, a new kind of whaling fleet in the 1920s. Um, and it's a fully mechanized uh, kind of factory setup where you have a massive central processing ship that's able to take a whale and break it down into all of its component parts. Um, and then little catcher boats that would go out and actually do the harpooning. Um, and really critically for the industry, the Norwegians also figure out how to separate the taste of whale from the fat so that you can turn whales into products that people will eat. Um, margarine, course, you say. <laughs> margarine, yes. Yeah. So if you ate margarine, you know, I think about this when I've been watching The Crown recently, right? That when the, the queen is eating her toast, if she had margarine on it, you know, in 18, or 1940, um, she was probably eating whale. It was very big in Britain and in Norway and in a couple other countries in Northern Europe. And this this kind of innovation around whaling not just kind of brings it back as something that um, people can do, it changes the scope of the kinds of whales that people can kill. So all of those big whales that were not accessible to wooden tall ships are suddenly things that can be pursued and killed in large numbers. Um, and this means that over the course of the 20th century, about 3 million whales are killed worldwide by factory ships. Um, factory ships for you know, Germany, for Norway, Japan, the United States, a little tiny, basically some expats from the United States who buy into the industry. The United States is otherwise pretty much out of it. And then the Soviet Union. And I think the ways in which these factory fleets in the Soviet Union take on whaling um, as a pursuit that's that's kind of mechanized, that looks like a factory floor elsewhere in the Soviet Union, except one that's for disassembling whales rather than assembling tractors, is also one that ends up excluding the people who have been whaling the longest in the Bering, Bering Strait. Um, so there are very few, if any, I really struggled and looked pretty hard to see if Chukchi or Yupik people ended up on these whaling fleets and didn't find evidence of that. Um, but these whaling fleets are less tied to that floating coastline and that's the edges of the ice uh, compared to the previous ones because they can go out to the right. deep sea, the open ocean where some of these other species are, right? Yeah, so they're actually mostly not killing bowheads. There aren't that many to kill in the 20th century and they are considered a such a protected species that even the Soviet Union tries to avoid them, avoid killing them. Um, but instead they're you know going after sperm whales and humpbacks and fins and blues and pretty much any other other whale they can possibly catch. Um, and yes, they're not they're not tied to a coastal place. So I think they're far more likely to pull in these kind of fleets of people who are trained as as mariners from all across the Soviet Union rather than as people with specific whaling experience. And the Soviet Union actually sort of takes the local whaling practice, the gray and bowhead hunting that Yupik and Chukchi whalers had practiced and mechanizes that as well. Um, so there's a small fleet of kind of scaled down factory ships that does all of the killing of whales for the Soviet coastline um, after the Second World War. And it would just kind of bring, you know, they'd bring a gray whale carcass to shore and drop it off as opposed to letting people go out and do the hunting themselves. Um, and this was sort of done in the name of efficiency and it being, you know, less likely to result in whales that are struck and lost, um, but is, of course, also a piece of kind of an assimilationist tactic on the part of the Soviet Union to, you know, not have people practicing their traditional ways of making a living and instead turn it into something that's done by an expert class on behalf of these communities. It's really interesting we have this inversion then. You say towards the end where in a previous generation, it was the Soviets wringing their hands over how the capitalists were destroying the environment and extracting too much, but they couldn't do anything about it because it's so far off. And then into the 20th century, we now have the United States wringing its hands over the Soviets, um, you know, continuing to wail and stuff when we thought they shouldn't be. There's kind of, and and we, I mean, you write towards the end of how, in a way, the United States kind of really conveniently forgets its past sins of <laughs> unsustainable harvests of these animals you know, and really quickly starts looking down their nose at the Soviets for doing it later. Kind of yes. the historical memory yeah. of this is very convenient for, yeah, for America. Right. It would like to absolve itself of this. 
yeah, it's it's not as much discussed in the 20th century in the United States, right? The whaling becomes the problem of Japan and the Soviet Union um, in the 1970s, not something that the United States actually had practiced, you know, not that long before. And really pioneered. Uh, and really pioneered, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's a, yeah, a pioneered, that, that's a loaded term, but maybe it's an appropriate yeah. one here. Um, well, I don't want to take too much longer. What, what's the current state today in Beringia of of the of the humans, especially the indigenous peoples there, what's their current relationship with whales and walrus and reindeer along along the Bering Strait? How how do things look today? So in most communities along the coastlines, walrus and whales are still really critical, both you know culturally and in caloric terms. Um, they're not easy places to supply even in the twenty first century. So you know particularly on the Alaska side where the um, the kind of transportation network is less robust. It was not built by a Soviet style state. So it is actually a little bit less, um, has a little bit less capacity than on the on the Russian side, even though it's not socialist anymore. Um, but in both places, they're really critical foodstuffs. Um, and reindeer or caribou in North America also remain really critical um, to these communities. And the, the concern now, you know, commercial whaling is more or less gone from the earth. Um, there's a couple countries that still practice it, um, but it's it's not happening in the the North Pacific. Um, so th that's not a concern. the The issue that is probably likely to really impact the way that whales and people interact is actually shipping traffic. Um, the The amount of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean and in the Bering Sea has been kind of eroding dramatically, as I'm sure anyone who pays attention to the news um, even a little bit is aware of. I mean, did, um, did you post just a few days ago on Twitter? Because I saw a few people post this picture from one of the Diomede Islands. Uh, and and yes. there's, there's yeah. it's just a, a an open coast, no sea it's ice. It's open water. Yes. And it's December. Right. Yeah. That's right. unprecedented, And it should have started right? to freeze up in October. So we're, it's well past due. And the result of that is that the um, the Northeast Passage, which would be the route from Asia to Europe by going north of Russia, is likely to be um, open to shipping traffic in the summer months um, to be ice free in the next couple of years, um, or certainly within the next decade. And already the, the number of large vessels going up the northern coast it has gone up dramatically. And of course, with that comes increased marine noise, which is hard on pretty Whales. much all marine mammal species and I'm sure non-mammal species, but we know quite a bit of, from observing whales and um, walruses and seals. And all of these are animals that communicate vocally um, in the water. And that's a major part of their social lives and how they communicate with each other and find each other. Um, and also because with bowheads, like with right whales, there's a lot of concern about ship strikes. So here on the East Coast, the number of Atlantic right whales is um, basically Atlantic right whales are going extinct in real time. Like we're watching the numbers go down year after year after year, and they're going down because of ship strikes and entanglements and fish nets. Um, and the fishing nets are less likely in the Bering Sea at the moment, but certainly ships that run into bowheads um, can injure them to the point that, you know, they, they can't recover um, and that that is something that you know, communities all on both sides of the strait are really concerned about. Um, in addition to the fact that the sea ice retreat is really changing where and when walruses come near to places that people are. Um, sometimes the walruses have to spend a lot more time on land than they would normally, which is really stressful for them. They can't access food as well, um, or they're just simply incredibly far north. So if you live on St. Lawrence Island and you have to travel all the way north through the Bering Strait, to find ice that has walruses on it. That's a very different project than if it's, you know, two miles offshore. Um, well, for people who think about the American West, do you have any final parting thoughts to convince people to, to look north and to consider this as they, as they study the region, as they think about the environment and animals and resources and peoples? I think in general that um, the north and, and thinking about I think there's a there's a couple things for historians of the American West that are interesting. Partly is that Alaska, I think, just hasn't had as robust a scholarship about it as many other parts of the American West, and that it therefore has just lots of historical work that is is there for the doing. 
Um, and, you know, the, the archives are rich and interesting and its relationship with the United States and with the environment, if environmental history is your thing or indigenous history. I mean, there's some amazing scholars like Holly Geis um, and Jen Rose Smith who are, you know, working on Alaskan history. Um, and I think there's a, a really exciting generation, particularly of young indigenous historians and scholars who are coming out of Alaska. Um, but there is just so much um, that really hasn't been kind of put in the terms of professional history, I would say, um, and that has interesting stories to tell us um, about all sorts of questions. Um, and secondly, that it also, one of the things I found really exciting about this project from the perspective of Western history is that it pushes it into a discussion of Pacific history, which of course, you know, other historians like David Eagler and Ryan Tucker Jones and, you know, Lisa Wadowitz, there, there are plenty of people doing that, um, but I think it's an important move. Um, it, it kind of moves Western history out of a terrestrial focus um, and can connect it with some ambitions of American empire that, you know, potentially saw a manifest destiny going past Hawaii um, in ways that, you know, I certainly can't unpack. Um, I don't speak Indonesian or Japanese or any of the other languages that you would need to do this if you're working further south um, from where where I know anything. But um, I think it, there's a lot of potential there um, and really exciting work that's coming up. I mean, I already actually have, a, I've, I've penciled in a little list of, I know some forthcoming books that are kind of more the West, but Pacific world that I'm very excited to see come out. So uh, I think your book kind of fits nicely into this growing growing body of literature. Uh, well, thank you for um, spending a little time talking with us. And thank you um, for writing this book. And I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. This was delightful. All right. Take care. Well, that's it for this month. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you'll subscribe. Please leave us a review on whatever app or platform you're listening through, or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates, leave comments, and communicate with me. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Rudd Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. We are an interdisciplinary research center that supports academic research and the promotion of public understanding of the North American West. We host regular public lectures, which we live stream. We have an annual funding cycle with awards, grants, fellowships, in categories that nearly anyone researching and working on the region from nearly any disciplinary approach or towards nearly any kind of final product can apply. Learn more at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D center.byu.edu. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Anderson. That's Anderson with an O, dot com. I'll put a link in the episode description. My name is Bren Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, just about everything else, so you can direct praise or critique my way. I'm the author and editor of a number of books uh, and other studies on the West, Borderlands, Native Peoples, Genocide Studies, Religion, and the Environment. To contact me about the podcast, my own research, or just about anything else, head to bwrensink.org. That's B-W-R-E-N-S-I-N-K.org. Or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. Until next month, be well, be curious, and be kind. <laughs>